Dette er den ukentlige nyhetssendingen fra Europa. Every day they used to business sitting there for magic potions destroying me friends stealing his phone So so now wow what, what an interview with Chris there yeah, it was definitely um, upbeat. You know, his last one, he was he was he's getting hammered. Um, you know, by the government, they were trying to fine him. Uh, they were trying to block him in the courts. They were doing everything. They were getting really desperate. Uh, it does sound like some of those issues were resolved, and uh, it was definitely a good interview. Yeah, yeah. No, well done, Chris. He's he's so active. That guy, it's Indeed. just unbelievable. I have to say though, uh, a lot of it was extremely technical. I, f I think the early part of it, like what he was going through, some of the technical data. I think I was having a little bit of trouble keeping up with that. But then I think in the second half of the show, we came around to more of the the human aspect and the simplistic view of it, like in terms of radiation and fallout yeah. and. And 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 the, and to think that the stuff from the early testing is still coming down that 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 was quite astounding really I wasn't expecting to to hear that yeah I mean the Fukushima uh, there was a there was a pulse of Fukushima pollution put up into the upper atmosphere with that large number three explosion mm. um, and, and that is circling the planet every I don't know, three or four weeks or something I hear I, I can't remember the exact uh, cycle uh, I think it's about a month I believe. Uh, it takes the, uh, the, the this pollution to cycle, and it's just doing that. So that'll be up there for uh, many decades as well, I should imagine. So. And, uh, and and that was an, an excellent um, extinction report too with, with Kevin Hester. I, mean, I know it was a bit longer than we sort of planned, but I think it was quite poignant too because we, we did get to cover Nagasaki and Hiroshima even in the extinction report. So, uh, yeah, it's been quite... A, uh, yeah, there's been a little bit of synchronicity going on this week too with uh, topics crossing each other I guess. Of course unfortunately we missed uh, one of our interviews which was with uh, Margarita Darcy. Uh, we have our roving uh, anonymous uh, reporter uh, who uh, basically managed to get an interview uh, with uh, uh, Margarita Darcy today in Galway at the uh, Nagasaki and uh, Hiroshima commemoration uh, for the uh, Irish contingent um, and uh, basically yeah so we, we've got that coming up but that will be put onto the www.europeannewsweekly.wordpress.com uh, website, our uh, our holding uh, homepage site. Uh, we're going to put that uh, that particular interview up there uh, over the next 24 hours when we get hold of it. Uh, but uh, yes, the indomitable Margarita Darcy, uh, who's a, a kind of world famous uh, Irish activist, um, and uh, a lot of people are aware of her, peace activist, and uh, uh, so she was. Uh, she, we, we have an exclusive interview with her, but unfortunately we couldn't get it for the show, so that's a, a shame. Well, it is, but look, it, it'll it'll be there for prosperity anyway, so. Certainly, yeah. We, we, we we'll probably be playing it on next week's show, uh, but uh, for anybody who's uh, who would like to catch it and uh, you know updated, uh, I'll probably say be checking that uh, European News Weekly dot WordPress uh, site. Uh, basically, uh, very shortly, you know, probably by tomorrow, I think we should have it up to a bit of light. Hopefully, hopefully. So um, we're in the last hour, and um, I had a couple of little miscellaneous subjects before we start going over to Ireland. And uh, because we've been having uh, our, we've been having the odd nipple story, right, uh, here, there. But this week we actually have a breast story. So we had Hong Kong breast walk held over a court ruling. Now this is an article from Zoe Hu, and it was uh, it was put out on Al Jazeera dot com. And uh, protesters, including men wearing rainbow bras, decry jailing of a woman for bumping her chest against a policeman's arm. Now, wearing a, a rainbow of pattern bras over their shirts, dozens of protesters have gathered outside Hong Kong's police headquarters to protest against the conviction of Ning Li Ying, who was deemed guilty of assaulting a police officer with her breast during a protest. Now, Li, Li Ying was uh, sentenced to three and a half months in prison on, on July the 30th for bumping her chest against this uh, dude. Uh, I think he's a little bit of a prude, to be honest. 
honest, I think. Um, if you're something like me, you know, you'd be only you'd be well chuffed if a <laughs> if a lady would push up against you like that. But this guy apparently wasn't. So I think one of the uh, anti-feminists uh, was uh, interviewed at the protest, uh, and uh, one of the spokespersons for the breast walk said that um, that the the breast uh, uh, lol uh, I meant cop had put forth an unproductive narrative of the incident. So um, that, that was quite an interesting happening there. During the yeah, week, that is great seeing uh, all the people of Hong Kong just getting out onto the streets there uh, with their bras on yeah. and rubbing up, rubbing up against uh, all the policemen of Hong Kong. Uh, I would imagine the cop that brought those uh, charges, the policeman that brought those charges, is probably regretting it now uh, um, because, unfortunately, I think uh, most of the people wearing bras are men. So uh, basically, <laughs> it's, it's putting the, all his uh, police buddies right on the spot. And uh, but there's been no further arrests of uh, of uh, uh, bra laden attacks. Uh, no, you in, haven't in heard Hong of any Kong. more police getting shot down with uh, weapons of uh, of breast destruction, no? Exactly. So <laughs> it's uh, but that was uh, that was quite a, a great story there. Uh, you know, when we compare it with America, with people being shot dead at the first available opportunity, uh, I'm sure a breast attack there would uh, would have resulted in uh, multiple gunshot wounds. Uh, the, the Kalashnikovs would be out, yeah. Indeed. Yeah, so it's, uh, but in Hong Kong, at least, uh, I've, it, it does seem that uh, there is a certain amount of humour uh, with this particular one. And we do hope the uh, the activist in question uh, gets let off the charges. So I can't see uh, that going to court and people not laughing a lot. <laughs> no, it's, it's really hard to take it seriously, to be honest, you know. And uh, it's kind of offensive, really, that a judge would take such an extreme measure uh <laughs> it's just ridiculous really it's it's a sad state of affairs i think sean well i think it's a, just a also a sign of how how the establishment is trying to combat uh sort of mass uh, uh sort of public uh sort of uh rejection of uh, policy uh, the, the many policies that are being put up that people don't agree with um and uh you know using small charges as a way of uh, frightening people from protests, so th that, that's probably an underlying sort of uh, uh, sort of thing we have to bear in mind with this story. A more serious note, uh, but uh, certainly well done to people of Hong Kong for saying, right, if you're going to do that sort of thing, then we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's great. In England, of course, we've got uh, Netpol who uh, who are encouraging people to wear masks. Um, when they go to protest because of all the heavy su uh, surveillance that the police use in the UK uh, to take pictures of people and get as much information on them. Of course, those people can be at threat of being blacklisted and they can be of surety that they would be put onto the domestic extremist uh, de terrorist database uh, with many other uh, terrorist types. So, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's a very sad world we're in. And uh, obviously, China is renowned for being... Uh, for being uh, free and open, and uh, so the people of Hong Kong are even making a much bigger statement uh, with this bra uh, statement, the bra statement. But uh, isn't it interesting that uh, people in Hong Kong uh, really do sort of uh, uh, enjoy their right of protest, uh, irregardless of uh, of uh, what the authorities will think of them, or they'll put them into prison for rubbing up against the police. Well, and there's also the humor side to it as well, too, that like, uh, in spite of such fascism and that they can come out and pull off humorous demonstrations like that, I think it's a credit to the Chinese people. Uh, I'm now Absolutely. looking at them in a different light, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, there's, uh, and there's lots of protests around China we don't get to hear about. So uh, this one was well publicized, lots of pictures of uh, people wearing bras and generally rubbing up against things. And so. generally smiling and having a good time while doing they, they were having a great time. And, and uh, once again, we do hope the actors get a little charge. Uh, there's lots of other actors around the world that are being, uh, being uh, sort of nicked for uh, much smaller charges. And in, in the UK, Netpol, uh, and probably in Ireland in the near future, we'll be seeing all human rights lawyers being uh, kept very busy, too busy to take on any more cases. Uh, that's what's happening uh, in the UK. Well done, Patrick. I see Patrick Nee has posted in the chat box there. He's posted a link to the artist who made a canoe modelled on her vagina. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah, we covered that story. When, when we, was that last week or was that the week before we covered that story? But, yeah, well done, uh, Patrick. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were discussing that with John Doe, and, and there'll be an update on that 
because it's quite another serious thing in, in Japan. They've got the Official Secrets Act. Uh, they're becoming much more right-wing, uh, as they were in the Second World War. And uh, we're basically seeing uh, the uh, Japanese also uh, doing a very similar thing to the Hong Kong. They're getting out on the streets, they're demonstrating. Uh, but we do have uh, activists whose stories are being uh, sidelined. And this is one of those activists in Japan. Um, so, you know, when we bear in mind that the Japanese have something called the Penis Festival, uh, where they walk around with large phalluses, um, it seems a bit, a bit ridiculous that they'll be charging an artist who's got a canoe uh, just shaped out of her vagina, made out of a, a, a mould, if you like. So it's, uh, it's a bit, uh, is it, yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's important that we give some of these activists a, a voice, you know, uh, to be on a bit, bit on the serious side here. And uh, But there are many other activists in Japan and journalists in Japan that are being targeted as we speak, and we're not hearing their stories uh, so much. No, and I think it seems when we talk about these subjects uh, here in our own countries or wh wherever we've been heard around the world, I think it draws attention <laughs> to the subject, and I think in a certain sense it forces these um, these countries to, to rethink some of their decisions they, they may have taken, like in, in the jailing, uh, say, this woman, for example, like for apparently attacking the police officer with her breast. And, you know, and I think when the world starts to look at these stories and just see how ridiculous it is, it forces the, uh, the authority in these countries to, to, to take a second thought about some of these matters and reassess where they stand. Um. We would we would hope that punitive uh, arrests and charges are uh, will be a thing of the past. Uh, that they're a tool that have tried to be used against activists and protesters, um, and now we're, we'll uh, hopefully we'll see that that will be consigned to, to uh, the dustbin of history. <laughs> I think Patrick's going to make a, a model of his own manhood there, and uh, I think probably Patrick could probably best design it on something based on a submarine, maybe. <laughs> Just a thought. So <laughs> he'd be allowed to go to Japan and uh, be able to uh, submit that to the penis festival. Uh, and people would walk around, you know, with his uh, appendage, and, uh, and it would be perfectly legal. Uh, but as I say, this this yeah. other female artist is uh, is. Uh, is, is being uh, sort of targeted. And of course, women are uh, kind of viewed as second class citizens by some mem uh, members of the uh, male uh, sort of uh, members, uh, being the correct word there, members, of the yes. <laughs> population in Japan. Uh, there are some very queued up Japanese, as uh, we're well aware, but uh, and Japanese men as well. But uh, unfortunately, the culture there does uh, does does malign the uh, females. So anyway, we'll uh, we're, we're we're seeing uh, activists being mostly female, and uh, maybe changes coming in Japan. Let's hope it be soon. I hope so too. Now, on a different note, now I wanted to touch on another topic. This is also way out abroad uh, in a country country far away, Queensland. A man refuses to answer to name in Queensland court. Basically, it is an article coming out of au.news.yahoo.com. Now, an indigenous man who renounced his Australian citizenship to head a self-declared sovereign nation has been remanded in custody in Queensland after refusing to acknowledge his former name. Uh, Marumu Walubara uh, Yudinji, formerly press gallery journalist Jeremy Gihia, was charged at Gordon Vale in May after police al allegedly caught him using number plates and license, license issued by the unrecognised Yudinji government. Now, when asked whether he was the man known as Jeremy Gahia at a uh, see where's this Karen's Karen's local court on Monday, he replied, "I am Marumu in the appropriate persona." Now, the man who faces a number of charges, including breaching bail, uh, uh, said he had been detained and held in captivity against his will. I think the matter is of jurisdiction, he said. Uh, the, the Yudinji uh, were excluded from Commonwealth, Commonwealth uh, Constitution Act of 1901. Uh, a, a picture posted on Twitter in May indicated at least seven sets of plates had been made, uh, and Magistrate J Jane Bentley said she uh, she couldn't grant Mr. Keir bail because the person he says is not him. Now, in an update on that, uh, a couple of days later, was this, that was on August 3rd. Now, on August the 4th, and coming out of the Australian.com.au, the Queensland self-declared nation leader released, right? So the indigenous man who renounced his Australian citizenship to head a self-declared nation has been released 
after refusing to acknowledge his formal name in court two days in a row. He was remanded in custody on Monday for refusing to answer to the formal name uh, in the uh, Cairns Magistrate Court and on Tuesday repeated his stance uh, uh, th that he is uh, Marumu in the appropriate persona. I, I'll, I'll, I'll take it on that basis that effectively you are not Jeremy David Joseph Gehea Magistrate. Robert Spencer said on Tuesday, <laughs> you will be released from custody. Um, he doesn't accept the right uh, of the Australian courts to rule over him because they can. They never had the participation of the traditional owners of this country. So basically that was just a, a little interesting story going on on sovereign issues there in Australia during the week and an interesting case. Now interestingly enough, um, uh, that the uh, even though that he's been released and that they've sort of like they're not giving up on the case so the case is going to be going ahead and that a notice will be sent again to Mr. Kea uh, and if he didn't appear the matter would be heard without him so the case is still going on ahead in the matter of Mr. Kea but Mr. Kea is not Mr. Kea at all but uh, <laughs> it's, just, it's just mad Sean mad but uh, that's an interesting sovereign story <laughs> yeah no it is actually it's uh I know uh, First Nations also, there's quite a lot of uh, sovereigns within, uh, with them, them and we, we also cover First Nations issues as well, so uh, in Canada and America. So. Uh, but uh, but these, these are important sort of uh, legal fights that are going on uh, in terms of uh, these, sort of native, uh, these indigenous peoples uh, trying to uh, assert their rights in their own homelands and things. So that's uh, it's a really kind of powerful uh, argument. It's good to see they're using uh, all the possible mechanisms they can to uh, to achieve their aims. Well, it is. It's interesting to say the least because uh, everywhere we look these days, people are sort of like exploring ideas of sovereignty. And even though we may not all be on the correct road, I think eventually we may actually get there and break free from the shackles of the these corporate shackles that we seem to be bound and tied with. So uh, we might figure it out someday and uh, get control back on this. I'm animal sure there's common, we... common, gra common ground for all. Mm. Now, then, of course, there's also the other big break in the story there during the week now, while we're still staying out abroad, and Obama warns US Jews Israel will bear the brunt of a new deal is next, right? So, this was coming out of the JewishPress.com, an article by Hannah Levi Julian, published on August the 5th. Now, US President Barack Obama warns Jewish leaders Israel will bear the brunt if Congress rejects a nuclear deal with Iran. Now, during a two-hour meeting with Jewish leaders from across the religious and political spectrum uh, that followed Netanyahu's pleas for American Jews to fight the deal, Obama tried to rebuke the Prime Minister's arguments. Uh, sources at the meeting said Obama said the discussion focused on personal atta attacks rather than the merits of the deal uh, could threaten the unity of the American Jewish community and also strengthen the U.S.-Israel uh, relationship. Uh, Obama also said that he truly believes that if the deal will will be rejected by Congress, the ultimate result will be a military strike, but the results of such a strike won't be a war with Iran, the president allegedly said. Now, Iran isn't going to aim its nuclear its weapons at the United States, pitch its annual budget of $15 billion against the US military, uh, and the American budget of $600 billion. So, I just thought now, there were quite interesting moves that we're seeing coming. Is America just about to throw Israel to the wolves. I, I would doubt that very much. Uh, mm. But having said that, though, uh, Israel has uh, generated enough bad PR for any political system to sort of start thinking about uh, distancing themselves from them. Uh, but, you know, there's also a lot of other countries, uh, like the UK, where, uh, and, and Ireland, uh, the Irish government, uh, that are uh, very much getting in behind uh, Israel and uh, supporting them still. But uh, but there is definitely a huge move. I mean, J uh, Israel has lost 50% uh, of its exports, uh, I think it's last year. So oh, nice, basically, right. the, yeah, they, they did that in one year after the Gaza strike. And, uh, and I think really uh, we're seeing a growing uh, sort of uh, movement uh, really against, uh, you know, for bo boycott and divestment, uh, basically, of Israel. Mm. Israel and uh, uh, and it's, it's a growing uh, thing. So the PR companies are doing everything they can.
can to uh, mitigate uh, this problem, uh, which uh, involves not talking about it uh, generally. So, but uh, obviously in the alternative media, there's lots of figures coming out and uh, why boycott and divestment is. Uh, and I have to say, you know, when they're talking about the, you know, t- the targeting the American Jews, uh, uh, most of the American Jews are actually very much against what Israel government is doing. Uh, Gorgeous, uh, yeah. Especially the Orthodox Jews, yeah. Big time, big time. And uh, it's not just even the Orthodox. Uh, it, the, 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 the mainstream Jewish uh, people in America, I mean, we've got Naomi Klein, uh, Naomi Wolf, sorry, uh, as one person who's, uh, who's been very strongly against what's been happening there and many voices from, uh, uh, Arab voices to Jewish voices have been uh, oh, really? uh, seen and linked to and on is, her is, blog. Is Naomi uh, from Jewish origin? Has she got a Jewish? Yeah, yeah really. Interesting. And, uh, but, uh, and, you know, we've got a Jewish Voice for Peace uh, on Facebook. Uh, they put out a lot of information um, uh, about uh, Jewish activism against Israel uh, and uh, news that, uh, that, that you wouldn't be hearing otherwise um, and lots of opinions uh, uh, by Jews uh, about what's happening and how wrong it is. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, there is a, a very lively debate within the, the Jewish community. And, uh, of course, what we're seeing at the moment, and this is even within Israel to a degree, but certainly outside Israel where the control, the government and the, uh, uh, the, the more radical groups have less control, uh, we, we see a much larger voice and a, a, and a very angry uh, response to uh, what's going on because the Jews in Israel can't, you know, if they, if they say anything against uh, the government, or they get targeted by groups of radical uh, sort of Jews and, uh, you know, settler uh, guys and what have you. I mean, to be honest with you, the, the whole situation there, especially with the settlers, is, uh, is uh, very dicey. Uh, we're seeing uh, settlers are uh, even challenging the government so it's, it's, it's there's uh, there's so many different groups and uh, sort of uh, people pulling in different ways in Israel now, and it's uh, and this is very obvious to the uh, American Jews and the Jews of the world uh, that are basically uh, very much against uh, what's happening uh, and uh, are calling for peace and reconciliation. Uh, well, I was listening one day, and I actually recorded it. It was off YouTube. Now, the audio was very, very bad, but um, I recorded it, and I have it saved in one of the older podcast folders, which is on another drive, and I meant to play it at some stage. But it was an MSM report, and there were four Jewish rabbis from the Orthodox Jewish uh, rabbis, basically, and they were having this discussion, this roundtable discussion about Israel, and how they were so against the idea of Israel, and, and they were explaining that because the way what's written in, into the Jewish religious books, Jews are not meant to have a homeland. It's totally against what is written in their religious books. Now, I just found this astounding. Now, and they, the Orthodox Jewish people seem to be so against the whole concept of a, of, of a Jewish homeland, no matter where it is, because it's written into their books, they are not supposed to have a homeland or a place to call home. They are supposed to be free of, of, of all that. So um, I just found that an interesting comparison. I will root that out one of these days, and I will play that um, somehow it's just got lost with all the busy stuff that we've been doing Sean you know but I just it was a short six seven minute piece and I must root that out and because it was very very interesting listening yeah no I mean that that one uh, did, did come up as well and it was it was very interesting they were talking about the the technicalities and, you know but uh, and, and you know that point really you know a lot of, a lot of Israeli a lot of Jews I should say uh, live in many different countries they're citizens of many different countries including Ireland and uh, they're basically, you know, very much into what's happening in those countries. Uh, you know, sort of worrying about some other country somewhere else is, uh, you know, is probably, you know, something they don't particularly, you know, want to do um, because they have their own problems in their own countries. Um, and uh, that sort of goes along with uh, what this rabbi was saying, you know, about, about not having a homeland. Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, and I suppose from a religious perspective, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's uh, kind of understandable. You wouldn't need a, a homeland, you just need your beliefs. Yeah, you are here, and that's, you know, we come into this world with nothing and we go out with nothing. <laughs> you know, that's what, you know, this is the sum total of life. You know, we're, we're not here to own stuff, we're only here as care- caretakers in a sense, and I don't think we're doing a very good job. Good philosophy. <laughs> now, I'm going to pull us into the Irish section now, right? 
because uh, we're at 1828 and um but sticking on the subject of israel okay so uh, an interesting one came out there during the week from the ireland palestine solidarity campaign which uh, can be found over at a uh, ipsc.ie now whoa <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> you just have to blow my eardrums. <laughs> so, basically, it was a note on barcodes. Now, uh, Israel has not changed its barcodes to defeat BDS, basically. So, I'll, I'll just read a little bit of this because this is quite important. Now, stories and images have been doing the rounds on social media sites claiming that Israel has changed its barcodes from 729 to 871 for a... Uh, uh, or other numbers uh, like 500 in order to fool people looking out for the 729 barcode. Now, the mistaken belief stems from uh, a misunderstanding of how barcodes work. A barcode only tells you which country a company is from, not where the contents of the product originate. What appears to be happening is that 871 is the, is the Dutch barcode and 500 is the UK one. The Israeli products are being sold by Dutch and UK and even Irish based companies. To take a concrete example, in the case of Tesco's Meat Free Mints, uh, Tesco's is a UK based company, so the barcode is 500, even though the product inside is manufactured and packaged in Israel. Now, what is important for barcode purposes is where the company who sells the goods are registered, not where the contents of the goods are produced, manufactured, or packaged. Now, a country cannot simply change its barcode ass uh, assignations because it uh, it feels like it. It doesn't work like that. And barcode assignation is a complicated and regulated international process. This is just another reason to always look for the country of origin of a product and not rely solely on the barcode. Uh, similarly, some things that may be made in a third country are sold by Israel registered companies with the 729 barcode, even though they may say... Uh, for example, made in Taiwan on the packaging. So, uh, <laughs> these should also be boycotted too. So, just uh, just a little bit of a, an interesting article coming out there from the uh, IPSC.ie, which is the Ireland-Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Yeah, wow. So, um, I, I've got a little story here about uh, <clears throat> the uh, former Pink Floyd uh, uh, sort of a front man sparks fury by comparing Israel to the Nazis. Uh, this is a story obviously about, uh, Roger Waters. Um, and it's on uh, gmmuk.com. Um, and, uh, so basically he's, he's just, uh, he, he's, well, he's reportedly, uh, compared the Israelis to the Nazis. Um, and, uh, yeah. So I think, I think this is uh, also from The Guardian, basically, has actually reported this, uh, this particular article. And, um, yeah, so I just say there's, uh, he's also been behind a lot of different, uh, uh activists and, uh, uh, basically artists to, uh, to boycott Israel, uh, for, you know, for their groups. Although some haven't, um, he's certainly been, uh, been trying anyway. So, uh, I thought I'd just mention that, uh, while we were on, on the topic. Oh, good man, good man. So we've got lots of Israel stories today. Now, yeah. we were discussing now last couple of weeks the air code post system now and, I hadn't done a huge amount of research into the postcode thing, but I was actually, I did come across an interesting article there during the week, uh, and it was coming out of the Irish Times now, and uh, and it seems to be that there is some data protection issues at stake here now. So a private impact, uh, a privacy impact assessment prepared for the Minister for Communications, Alex White, ahead of the launch of the air code, strongly advised him to adopt a precautionary approach that there was a, a case for handling air codes uh, in accordance with data protection legislation. Now, who would have imagined that, Sean? Hey, <laughs> you know, like hello, <laughs> people's private data and all that. Like, who would imagine that there might ever be a privacy issue at stake here? You know, now sure. experts consulted uh, uh, consulted for the privacy assessment, uh, which was published on the uh, department's website, said that it was possible that information about unique addresses would be disclosed to organizations that had not previously had routine access to a person's ad address information. Right? Now, some of this information may be considered sensitive personal data, the study said. Now, assessing the risks to individuals from air codes, the report said that it had found uh, hard to unearth evidence that data controllers would be tempted to process air codes unfairly. Now, 
potential impact of a body having an uncertain legal basis for processing someone, someone's error code was a problem at the uh, irritant level for individuals, apparently, you know. Now, so are they, are they, are they suggesting that the error codes are the property of the individual? I don't think so. It's, it's very interesting because we, we obviously were talking about air code. It's something that we've been keeping a bit of a track on because, you know, 28 million to Capita, a big uh, corporation that does a lot of the uh, sort of uh, computerized aspects of a lot of privatized uh, sort of uh, uh, sections of, uh, of public uh, services in the UK uh, is starting to come over here and, uh, and has got a nice little contract to set up this air code, even though there was a free one available. Um, the, of course, the reason why air code important, we main, I, I was positing, uh, is because they need it for the computer systems to get rid of post office and various other uh, sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, public uh, systems um, and replace that with privatized ones, uh, being able to use a postcode system, uh, which is something that they use in the UK. And we see how privatization is going in the UK. The, the whole system is starting to uh, buckle under the strain. Right, yeah, because they we're also looking at marketing profiles now in this article, um, and uh, the June 2015 privacy assessment also said that it was unlikely that uh, citizens currently fully appreciate the extent to which the personal information is used by organisations that create market profiles. Now, in October, the Commissioner wrote that the departments uh, stating that individuals must be on notice that where they disclose their error code, they have disclosed uh, their specific address and not just a non-specific address that specified their location to it in, say, 30 buildings, right? Now, I'm not sure how other postcodes work in, in that sense. Like, if, if we're looking at the English system of postcodes, will a postcode disclose the actual person's address, say, in an English If code? you have the person's name and you have the code, you, you know who they are, you know what number they live at, you like. Right, okay, okay, interesting. Now, also... The Irish Fire Brigade and the Emergency Services Association has raised concerns about the code system, and the Freight Transportation Association and the DHL have said they will not use it. I think they probably realise that this will be, they'll be uh, opening themselves up to competition from international companies who will come in, like Uber, who will come in and be able to use that system to uh, operate their businesses. So okay. uh, right. that's, that's, that's the setup there, I think. Mm. And they're also saying here that uh, the Airco system is not compatible with GPS devices or Google Maps, uh, and up to 50,000 Irish place names were inaccurate or missing, according to uh, on Conrad Nagelga. Now, that's quite interesting, because I've noticed, when I look up the particular address that I use online, and when I look at the address that's been posted out through, um, through billing companies and, and the like, None of them spell the address right. It's all spelled wrong. <laughs> you know, um, you know. Yeah. So I, I see where you know. I can agree, totally agree that most of the place names in this country are probably not even spelled right. You know, so it's a quite well, there's, there's there's another thing as well because the postcode is generally you know it, it would cover an area, a certain area. Yeah. Uh, basically, that area could have a river going through it, um, and in terms of getting there. It, it may be a case that you actually have to go another route, uh, but the, uh, the although the postcode may be partially on that bit of land, you know, to get to the bit you want, you you know, it's on the other side of a river and you have to do 20 mile detour. Uh, not, not good if you're uh, delivering a parcel to that particular place. And uh, there are a lot of different uh, glitches that you see on the UK uh, version of the uh, postcode. Yeah, I think that was one of the points yeah. I did actually bring up last week while I was staying. <laughs> while I, while I, the one time that I was on point was that there, there is a systematic sort of like um, design inbuilt into the UK system of postcodes, which is sort of like absent from the Irish model because it's all all postcodes are apparently assigned in a random sort of a nature so they're not uh, they're, they're not easily usable by delivery companies for example and uh, so yeah there's, there's a lot of I'm sure we're going to be hearing lots more about this topic now as uh, as we get closer to the deadline date when it's coming to kicking into place or is it already kicked into place I don't know uh, well, no, the, it has already come in. Everybody's got their uh, postcodes, air codes, or you can get them online. 
Um, apparently, when it comes with it, it's a bit like the water charges. So, uh, you know, you don't have to actually use it. And, uh... No, no. That's what I gathered from last week, that interview that we played last week, that it, was, it wasn't mandatory to use it on envelopes, for example. Like, but, um, you know. <laughs> so... it, it is for computerized systems. And, and let's also bear in mind when they're talking about privacy of data in the UK, all medical data has been sold to a private corporation. Uh, when you're talking about PR companies, you know, uh, basically doing marketing and what have you through these, we're talking about WPP, a very large, one of the biggest PR companies in the world that's working in the UK, in Ireland, sorry, uh, with uh, Shell Oil. And they're, they're running the strategy against the activists and protesters that are against the uh, Shell Oil uh, sort of uh, endeavor down there. And there are many reasons for people to be protesting against it. Um, and uh, those people are being targeted, uh, they're being uh, spied on, they're being harassed, they're being followed around by security uh, companies. Um, and uh, so that's this particular air code also helps uh, the, uh, uh, the PR companies to market that sort of uh, sales, it's the sales pitch of fear. Uh, but uh, they can use it also to sell, you know, to target you for various types of advertising. But uh, there is another seedier side to the PR companies and WPP, uh, Burston and Muller. They're all part of the uh, Shell Oil Action Group, uh, who are also working with a, a sort of very uh, sort of uh, security companies uh, that will be spying on people, journalists, activists, uh, and anybody else that they suspect as well. Uh, nobody will be immune uh, to that type of surveillance, you know, where they're working. Um, and so, yeah, uh, the air code will also be tying that stuff uh, together. It will make it much easier for them to know where activists are, uh, how to track them, and so on and so on. Right. So, listen, will we move on from the air cords then a little bit, man? There was another little bit of an interesting one floating around there during the week uh, concerning Irish water and uh, concerning EU rules did not compel Ireland to bring in Irish charge uh, water charges uh, and that our politicians did. Now, there's an article by Colette Brown uh, from the independent.ie and uh, after 10 years of negotiation, uh, the Water Framework Directive was finally agreed by EU member states. It was reported at the time that a compromise practice package on the legislation was agreed, giving Ireland a derogation from a requirement to meter water. The directive allows a member state uh, or states to opt out of the obligation uh, if it conflicts with national practice. Now, a derogation is an exemption from or a relaxation of the rule or law. Now, the European Commission wasn't happy about it, but the derogation was included in the text of the directive of the Article uh, 9.4. Uh, despite this, we are now being told that uh, derogation is worthless and that the previous government effectively rendered it null and void. Now, how many times have we hear the previous government being blamed for everything? So, uh, speaking in December, Environment Minister Alan Kelly said that there was no longer any way for the country to uh, evade water charges due to the manner in which the agreement with the Troika was signed up to by the previous government. There we go again. That's, I love this deflection. We do not have a derogation because we now have committed to the model that we have. So basically, Mr. Kelly said rather bluntly, uh, as is written here in the paper, and uh, did, did I, take a, I took a note to self here. One would forgive Mr. Kelly for blaming the previous government, uh, but the second statement, he, he clearly says the model we signed up to, uh, uh, to uh, so is he referring to his own party or what? Uh, <laughs> no, I did. I think I said what a bloody nutter after that. So sorry about that, Mr. Kelly. Uh, that was uh... <laughs> yeah. so. Uh, yeah. So it just seems that uh, they're making the rules up as they go along, and uh, they do what they like, basically. <laughs> so well, they're, they're making the rules up, and they're making the news up. Um, so you know, when I'm sort of one one story I picked up on uh, was uh, Afshin, uh, Afshin Ratanzi from uh, Going Underground on right. RT. Uh, he basically brought in a story about bombings in Belfast, and he interviewed uh, Ma Maria McCann, a journalist and broadcaster from City Beat radio station in Belfast, um, and she was discussing the fact that uh, in many of the poor areas and all around Northern Ireland. In many of the poorer areas, there's been a, a social uh, disruption, and it's taking a kind of a, a political uh, form. And uh, it sounds like, you know, that uh, many people are uh, uh, doing actions against the, the authorities, so the, maybe the police and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, one of the things is uh, they've been doing a lot of hoax bomb threats, uh, but, uh, you know, there's basically a bomb actually went off in Belfast. 
Um, and, you know, these things are just not covered at all. Uh, and neither is the social unrest. Um, and she, uh, to balance it, she was also saying in, in uh, the poorer areas where the loyalists live, uh, that they've been targeting, um, they've been targeting uh, Polish uh, immigrants and uh, any other immigrants as well. So, you know, so you know, with black skin or um, so basically we're seeing a lot of social unrest going on. Uh, of course, the media is uh, spinning the anti-immigrant theme and that's certainly helping to inflame tension. Um, but uh, what we're not hearing is uh, is the fact that everything is kind of spinning into a you know from Derry to Belfast. It's all spinning into a a much more uh, regular. This is her main point that this is happening much more often. Um, and you know this could be spilling out into the rest of Ireland uh, unless uh, these people get some uh, recognition and some solutions are brought in. Uh, I think the main thing that seems to be coming to mind is the. Uh, sort of new austerity practices and the old austerity practices by the uh, government um, and uh, they're not really uh, encouraging businesses to, to go to poorer areas and therefore the poorer areas are uh, are not uh, doing well at all um, so I think uh, there certainly seems to be some very important structural things to keep the peace going uh, but if we uh, if we just let things go the way they are, it, it, we could be in big problems. And, uh, <clears throat> we'd like to see if we can get hold of Maria McCann for an interview for the show uh, concerning this issue. And uh, but uh, that'll be for another day, I think. But uh, but there's certainly a very good. You know, if you go to uh, Going Underground, um, then by on RT, it's uh, one of the documentary, uh, one of the regular shows that go out, and uh, just look for bombings in Belfast. You can find that on YouTube. Interesting how we have to go to uh, foreign sources to get like interesting stories coming out of this country, isn't it? Well, I mean, Afshan Ratanzi is actually English, and he's just working via. Uh, he's a you know an accomplished uh, journalist mm. anyway, mm. but he's he got a job with RT, um, and you know a lot of his stuff he gets censored. You know, <laughs> he's he's quite uh, he's quite uh, he, he does uh, really dig around for the uh, the sort of the left wing view, if you like. Um, although he can be very balanced, he's had uh, also people show. But uh, heads up to him for uh, giving Maria McCann a, a voice. Um, she should be all over uh, RTE as well, you know, and all the other uh, newspapers. And um, hopefully if we can get an interview with her and it's uh, interesting enough for them, maybe a, a few stories might come out. Of it. Mm, hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. Right, so um, I picked up on a little story there also during the week uh, concerning uh, prisons and... Uh, Half of the people in prison in Ireland last year were jailed for not paying fines, basically. Now, this was on August the 6th, and it came out through the journal.ie. And uh, so basically, in Ireland, 55% of those in prison were jailed for non-payment of fines. Um, this was out of a total of approximately 18,000 individuals that were sent to prison last year. Difficulties arose in the fact that uh, once someone had been imprisoned, that they are left with a criminal record, something that can impede their ability to travel and live abroad. Uh, it seems now plans are in place to change the way the system works with the introduction of, uh, of the Payment and Recovery Act of 2014. And under the new legislation, a number of uh, alternatives are available, including uh, paying in installments, recovery orders uh, and attachment to earnings uh, imprisonment will remain as a, as an action of last resort like but uh, you know i i think even these attachment to earnings and all these that you know it's it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a different type of a prison only it's a, it's one without bars in my opinion you know nobody should be you know it's a civil matter no it, it should never come before courts said the matter of like uh, of, 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 of civil like anything that's civil should not be before the courts at all no need for it ah, well i'll uh, i would uh, sort of uh, support that view i think uh, we certainly have uh, uh, lots of criminals that are uh, getting away with lots of uh, lots of stuff uh, uh, not to mention, we we can't mention his name, but Mr. Redacted. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Dennis R. Redacted, is it? <laughs> Dennis R. Redacted. I, mean, I thought it was uh, Redacted O. O'Brien. Oh, it could be. Like... <laughs> I mean, he didn't actually say his name. Anyway, so, Dennis but, Redacted uh, Brian. <laughs> well well done. Waterford Whispers now. Uh, sorry, Waterford Whispers News, uh, who have been uh, covering uh, the uh, Dennis O. Redacted O'Brien uh, story. Uh, let's and... know, uh, we have to... Make sure you say this correctly. Now, it was the dinosaur redacted that lives in the alternative universe, right? Well, that's the alternative universe uh, <laughs> version of his uh, his life. And uh, yeah, no, it was really good. Uh, it, uh, 
I, I presume most most of the Irish viewers would have probably tipped into this, and uh, 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 probably a few other uh, from around the world as well. They're probably uh, still laughing. <laughs> yeah, but he's he, he's a uh, guy a guy called Dennis O'Brien, very rich, and powerful person who's up to all sorts of various things. Uh, very well known in Ireland and getting more well known by the day. Um, and he's uh, he's a tactor. Uh, basically a satirical uh, journal um, and uh, there's certainly a lot of doubt as to whether if it went to court that they would uh, basically have to you know whether they would lose or not but uh, unfortunately they're a small journal they can't afford legal fees so they pulled the story straight away when they asked uh, and then they put up another story apologizing to somebody else actually uh, Gilligan and, uh, uh, so, John Gilligan wasn't it was, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's become a sat satirical web of, of, uh, of uh, dialogue uh, we're expecting Waterford Whispers to be uh, totally taken off the internet, and uh, <laughs> and uh, but, but in theory, I doubt that very much. No, um, but, it was uh, quite interesting that I, I think it was interesting that they the, somebody had the audacity to copy and paste uh, Dennis O'Redacted's head and stick it onto uh, John Redacted's head, body, like you know. I just <laughs> thought that was very very interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it was certainly a lot of satirical stuff going on there. Um, but, you know, it's, it's interesting. The guy owns half of Ireland's uh, media. Uh, the other half of Ireland's media were very supportive of uh, Waterford Whisperer's news and the, the fact that they should be allowed to do satirical pieces without uh, without people being, you know, suing them, basically. So, uh, Especially somebody otherwise... with no sense of humour. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's. Uh, I think at the end of the day, I, I think this will uh, come back to bite him because it, it got, so, you know, it's now, instead of having 40,000 views, it's probably had about 40 million. Million views. Uh, whoops, whoops, that's all I can say. The PR companies are probably trying to come up with some, some way of sorting it out. Uh, it probably involve hacking uh, the uh, Waterford Whispers uh, news website, uh, like they have uh, recently with Libby Halevi. They hacked her and then uh, mysteriously her PayPal uh, uh, link, funding donation link, has been, as she found out, has been uh, blocked for some time now. Um, so uh, we're seeing uh, that sort of thing going on in America at the moment. Uh, we uh, haven't seen that over here yet. So, well, well done, Waterford Whisperers, and it's good to see that their uh, their website is still up. Yeah. Now, and we're hotly approaching the top of the hour, and um, we've been getting reports now quite consistently since we more or less started up this show about the corruption within the DPP and the Gardaí. And yeah. yet again, I see the same information being posted out through Facebook uh, this morning, yeah. and. Uh, Basically, the headline is corruption within Gardaí and the DP's office. And this is an article that came out of the Pressnet.tv. Now, we only had minimal time, uh, and you've read this before, and we actually we haven't really covered this, and we should cover it, basically. So, it was an, a, an email sent to Minister Brendan Howland, and it, I'll just read it. It's with great regret I present post, uh, this posting to you and request that you set about investigating uh, this as a matter of urgency. We received this email today and are still shocked and dismayed at the contents. It appears to be a snapshot of the corruption within the legal system uh, in the rotten states uh, of ours and I'm not surprised if the political system is rotten. Then it comes as no surprise to me and uh, a lot of other independent journalists throughout Europe. Ireland is not alone in this regard. But here in Germany, there is uh, institutions one can access to get plaints of this nature to be fully investigated. Justice must be seen to work for the ordinary man on the street. Uh, corruption uh, and boys club ex uh, exposed here must be dismantled and the culprits must be brought to justice. Uh, I'm uh, calling on you, the minister, to make a statement on the allegations presented in this post. I'm sure that the Irish public will want a clear statement from the Minister that is the sort of conduct by serving members of the Gardaí will not be tolerated and all such infringements of citizens' rights will be fully investigated. Sincerely, Thomas Angus O'Cleary. Now, I took a little bit of time just to run through some of the links because we've done this before. We've, we've actually followed through on a few of these links and we found that there were dead links, right? Now, I noticed today, now, um, I noticed some dead links. Now, first assumption was tinfoil hat on right but then i noticed some of the links were malformed uh, and what i mean by malformed is that the link that was posted into as the link to follow had a couple of little characters added on to the end of the html so i call that a malformed link uh, but because when i done a separate search on a similar topic 
the information is there. Now, I've just got a couple of little excerpts from this now before we run out of time. Uh, one is an expert British soldier claims detectives uh, gave him cannabis in order to get close to Ian Bailey. Right? Now, that link was dead. But I did do a search and I found a corresponding link over in northernsound.ie. Uh, witnesses, uh, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, that, that link was okay. So witnesses also claims Gardy beat him up with fears he would expose Bailey case corruption. Now this is in relation to the one just previously about the ex-soldier claims. Now this is an article that was on the uh, newstalk.com site. Now Brit British soldier uh, Mark Graham claims Gardy beat him up in the back of the car on the 14th of January 2015. Uh, 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 the British soldier had given evidence that the guard beat him up and threatened his life in the back of the car over fears he had tape recordings that would reveal they were corrupt. Uh, Martin Graham told the High Court that the attack had happened after the, uh, he'd been given cannabis, cash uh, and a promise of a large reward if he could get a statement implicating Ian Bailey in the so Sophia Tuscan de Plantier murder. Now, link number two, TD says guard whistleblowers have new evidence alleging Gardy being involved in drugs, right? Now, what else is coming out on Newstalk.com, uh, 23rd of February, you can find it if you use that heading. And Daly told uh, the last word on Today FM that she had been in touch with two serving Gardy who are facing internal pressure in the force because of their allegations. The claims include Gardy being involved in drugs. And curiously enough, uh, we see that uh, the, the previous uh, ex-British soldier getting uh, given drugs. <laughs> um, you know, are we seeing links here? Special Criminal Court asked to direct finding of not guilty. This is another one uh, coming out of breakingnews.ie. Uh, that link was dead, but I did eventually find another link to it over at waterfordnews.ie. Now, the Special Criminal Court had been asked to direct a finding of not guilty in the case of three men charged with murdering dissident Republican Peter Utterly Took a note to self here. How, why is the court directing any jury to come to any sort of a finding? Surely, like, uh, judges have no authority to tell a jury what to do. But I'm, I'm just putting that out there. Maybe maybe I'm wrong in this matter, but I want to get through a couple of these bits and pieces here. Another one. Six senior guardie continue to cancel penalty points, including their own. This was in uh, the independent.ie uh, from the 23rd of the 1st, 2015. Uh, the cancellations by uh, senior guardie included some which were outside their own areas, RTE News learned. The report which was obtained by the uh, National Broadcaster identifies nine instances where senior officers uh, cancelled points and seven cases where points were cancelled on what were the described as questionable grounds. Uh, another heading here, um, pair released that court ruled phone records cannot be used in a 2.28 million tiger raid. Now this was coming out of uh, breaking news at IE and two men previously jailed for taking part in the 2005 tiger raid have been found not guilty of a dramatic ruling that mobile phone records cannot be used as evidence in a case. Now how many cases have we seen over the last couple of years where phone records were used in cases? Um, another heading, Gardy uh, misled the department twice over the Boylan records. Now this is and this is an interesting story now and I think we have to cover this one, this, this Boylan case, but um, this is for another day Sean on, but uh, this is on Wednesday, the April 22nd. Now, uh, the Irish Examiner.com it revealed how the Gardaí failed to inform the Department of Boylan's seven year sentence in Britain in uh, 1997 for assessing cannabis. And, uh, and last year, the Department was not told of the five year sentence handed down by the Irish court. This would uh, not have been known. Uh, but for Boylan uh, of, Drum of, of Drumlear Loud declared in a license application. Now, Boylan contracted his local uh, LMFM uh, station during an interview with Transport Minister Noel Dempsey yesterday and said that he was up front with his application and he did not go on air and told researchers that the Guardian knew everything about the record. Now, we're running out of time here, so I'm going, there was only one more head in there, but I think you're getting the gist of where I'm going with this. Like, it's just, uh, I think we're going to have to cover this story properly, you know, uh, at some stage. So yeah, um, well, there's certainly a lot of other justice stories that we'll be looking at uh, as right. well. Um, We're out of time, Sean. Sean, I'm going to say goodbye everybody in the chat box. And uh, look, thanks for everybody tuning in. Sean, over to you. Do you want to do you want to say your goodbyes, mate? All right. Well, uh, goodbye. It's uh, just a quick heads up to the uh, uh, people in Norway. There's been an Ireland youth camp, re a camp reopening four years after the Brevik massacre of uh, many young people. Remember? But there's been a, a, a youth camp open this year for the first time. Business, business, it's the fountain. Oh, yes, oh, business, 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 business,
dinheiro Você diz business, business 